Chapter 1 Atlas The way asshole is misspelled in red spray paint across the back door of Bibbs makes me think of my mother. She would always insert a brief pause between syllables, making it sound like two separate words. I wanted to laugh every time I heard it, but it was hard to find the humor in it as a child when I was always the recipient of the hurled insult. Ass, hole, Darren mutters. Had to be a kid. Most adults know how to spell that word. You'd be surprised. I touch the paint but it doesn't stick to my fingers. Whoever did this must have done it right after we closed last night. Do you think the misspelling was intentional, he asks. Are they suggesting you're so much of an asshole that you're a whole entire ass? Why do you assume they were targeting me? They could have been targeting you or Brad. It's your restaurant. Darren takes off his jacket and uses it to pry a large shard of exposed broken glass out of the window. Maybe it was a disgruntled employee. Do I have disgruntled employees? I can't think of a single person on payroll who would do something like this. The last person I'd had quit was five months ago, and she left on good terms after getting a college degree. There was that guy who did the dishes before you hired Brad. What was his name? He was named after some kind of mineral or something, it was super weird. Quartz, I say. It was a nickname. I haven't thought about that guy in so long. I doubt he's holding a grudge against. Me after all this time. I fired him right after we opened because I found out he wasn't washing the dishes unless he could actually see food on them. Glasses, plates, silverware, anything that came back to the kitchen from a table looking fairly clean, he just put it straight on the drying rack. If I wouldn't have fired him, he would have gotten us shut down by the health department. You should call the police, Darren says. We'll have to file a report for insurance. Before I object, Brad appears at the back door, his shoes crunching the broken glass beneath his feet. Brad has been inside taking inventory in order to see if anything was stolen. He scratches the stubble on his jaw. They took the croutons. There's a confused pause. Did you say, croutons? Darren asks. Yeah. They took the whole thing of croutons that were prepared last night. Nothing else seems to be missing, though. That wasn't at all what I was expecting him to say. If someone broke into a restaurant and didn't take appliances or anything else of value, they probably broke in because they were hungry. I know that kind of desperation firsthand. I'm not reporting this. Darren turns to me. Why not? They might catch whoever did it. That's the point. I grab an empty box out of the dumpster and start picking up shards of glass. I broke into a restaurant once. Stole a turkey sandwich. Brad and Darren are both staring at me now. Were you drunk? Darren asks. No. I was hungry. I don't want anyone arrested for stealing croutons. Okay, but maybe food was only the beginning. What if they come back for appliances next time? Darren says. Is the security camera still broken? He's been on me to get that repaired for months now. I've been busy. Darren takes the box of glass from me and starts to pick up the remaining pieces. You should go work on that before they come back. Heck, they might even try to hit up Corrigan's tonight since Bibbs was such an easy target. Corrigan's has working security. And I doubt whoever it was will vandalize my new restaurant. It was a matter of convenience, not a targeted break-in. You hope, Darren says. I open my mouth to respond, but I'm interrupted by an incoming text message. I don't think I've ever reached for my phone faster. When I see the text isn't from Lily, I deflate a little. I ran into her this morning while I was running errands. It was the first time we've seen each other in a year and a half, but she was late for work and I had just received the text from Darren informing me we had a break-in. We parted somewhat awkwardly on the promise that she would text me once she got to work. It's been an hour and a half since then, and I still haven't heard from her. An hour and a half is nothing, but I can't ignore the nagging in my chest that's trying to convince me she's having doubts about everything that was said between us, in that five-minute exchange on the sidewalk. I'm definitely not having doubts about what I said. 
I might have gotten caught up in the moment, in seeing how happy she looked and finding out she's no longer married. But I meant every word I said to her. I'm ready for this. More than ready. I pull up her contact info in my phone. I've wanted to text her so many times over the last year and a half, but the last time I spoke to her, I left the ball in her court. She had so much going on, I didn't want to complicate her life even more. She's single now, though, and she made it sound like she was finally ready to give whatever could be between us a chance. However, she's had an hour and a half to think about our conversation, and an hour and a half is plenty of time to form regrets. Every minute that passes without a text is going to feel like a whole damn day. She's still listed as Lily Kincaid in my phone, so I edit her contact info and change her last name back to Bloom. I feel Darren hovering, looking over my shoulder at my phone screen. Is that our Lily? Brad perks up. He's texting Lily? Our Lily? I ask, confused. You guys met her once. Is she still married? Darren asks. I shake my head. Good for her, he says. She was pregnant, right? What did she end up having? A boy or a girl? I don't want to discuss Lily because there's nothing to discuss yet. I don't want to make it more than what it might be. A girl, and that's the last question I'm answering. I focus on Brad. Theo coming in today? It's Thursday. He'll be here. I head inside the restaurant. If I'm going to discuss Lily with anyone, it'll be Theo. Chapter 2 Lily My hands are still shaking, even though it's been almost two hours since I ran into Atlas. I can't tell if I'm shaking because I'm flustered or because I've been too busy to eat since I walked in the door. I've barely had five seconds of peace to process what happened this morning, much less eat the breakfast I brought with me. Did that actually just happen? Did I really ask Atlas a series of questions so awkward, I'll be mortified well into next year? He didn't seem awkward, though. He seemed very happy to see me, and then when he hugged me, it felt like a part of me that had been dormant suddenly sprang to life. But this is the first moment I've had to even take a bathroom break, and after looking at myself in the mirror just now, I kind of want to cry. I'm splotchy, I have carrots smeared across my shirt, my nail polish has been chipped since, like, January. Not that Atlas expects or wants perfection. It's just that I've imagined running into him so many times, but not one of those fantasies starred me bumping into him in the middle of a hectic morning, half an hour after being the target of an 11-month-old with a handful of baby food. He looked so good. He smelled so good. I probably smell like breast milk. I'm so rattled by what our chance encounter might mean. It took me twice as long to organize everything for the delivery driver this morning. I haven't even checked our website for new orders today. I give myself one last look in the mirror, but all I see is an exhausted, overworked single mom. I make my way out of the bathroom and back to the register. I pull an order from the printer and begin making out the card. My mind has never been more in need of a distraction, so I'm glad it's been a busy morning. The order is for a bouquet of roses for someone named Greta from someone named Jonathan. The message reads, I'm sorry about last night. Forgive me? I groan. Apology flowers are my least favorite kind of bouquets to assemble. I always end up obsessing over what they're apologizing for. Did he miss their date? Did he come home late? Did they fight? Did he hit her? Sometimes I want to write the number for the local domestic violence shelter on the cards, but I have to remind myself that not every apology is attached to something, as awful as the things that were attached to the apologies I used to receive. Maybe Jonathan is Greta's friend and he's trying to cheer her up. Maybe he's her husband and he took a prank a little too far. Whatever the reason for the flowers, I hope they mean something good. I tuck the card into the envelope and stick it into the bouquet of roses. I set them on the delivery shelf and am pulling up the next order when I receive a text. I lunge for my phone as if the text is about to self-destruct and I only have three seconds to read it. I shrink when I look at the screen. It's not from Atlas, but rather from Ryle. 
Can she eat french fries? I shoot a quick response. Soft ones. I drop my phone onto the counter with a thud. I don't like for her to have french fries too often, but Ryle only has her one to two days a week, so I try to make sure she gets more nutritious foods when she's with me. It was nice not thinking about Ryle for a few minutes, but his text has reminded me that he exists. And as long as he exists, I fear that any type of relationship, or even a friendship between me and Atlas, can't exist. How will Ryle take it if I start seeing Atlas? How would he act if they ever had to be around each other? Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. I stare at my phone, wondering what I should say to Atlas. I told him I would text him after I opened the store, but customers were waiting before I even unlocked the door. And now that Ryle has texted, I've gone and remembered Ryle exists in this scenario, too, which makes me hesitant to text Atlas at all. The front door opens, and my employee Lucy finally walks in. She always seems so put together, even when I can tell she's in a bad mood. Good morning, Lucy. She flicks hair out of her eyes and sets her purse on the counter with a sigh. Is it? Lucy isn't at her friendliest in the morning. It's why my other employee Serena or I usually work the register until at least 11, while Lucy puts arrangements together in the back. She's much better with customers after a cup or five of coffee. I just found out our place cards never arrived because they were discontinued, and it's too late to order more. The wedding is in less than a month. So much has gone wrong leading up to this wedding, I have half a mind to tell her not to go through with it. But I'm not superstitious. Hopefully she isn't either. Homemade place cards are in style, I offer. Lucy rolls her eyes. I hate crafting, she mutters. I don't even want a wedding now. It feels like we've been planning it for longer than we even dated. That's accurate. Maybe we'll just call it off and go to Vegas. You eloped, right? Do you regret it? I don't know which part of all that to address first. How can you hate crafting? You work at a flower shop. And I'm divorced, of course I regret eloping. I hand her a small stack of orders I haven't gotten to yet. But it was fun, I admit. Lucy goes to the back and starts on the rest of the orders, and I go back to thinking about Atlas. And Ryle. And Armageddon, which is what the two of them in my brain at the same time feels like. I have no idea how this is expected to work. When Atlas and I ran into each other, it was as if everything else faded away, including Ryle. But now Ryle is beginning to seep back into my thoughts. Not in the way thoughts of Ryle used to occupy my mind, but more in a way that feels like a roadblock. My love life has finally been on a straight path with no bumps or curves, basically because it's been non-existent for well over a year and a half, but now it feels like there's nothing but rough terrain and obstacles and cliffs ahead. Is it worth it? Of course Atlas is worth it. But are we worth it? Is us potentially becoming a thing worth the stress it would inevitably bring to all the other areas of my life? I haven't felt this conflicted in so long. Part of me wants to call Alyssa and tell her about seeing Atlas, but I can't. She knows how Ryle still feels about me. She knows how he'd feel if I brought Atlas into the picture. I can't talk to my mother because she's my mother. As close as we've become lately, I'd still never freely discuss my dating life with her. There's really only one woman I feel comfortable talking to about Atlas. Lucy? She appears from the back, pulling an earbud out of her ear. Did you need me? Can you cover me for a while? I need to go run an errand. I'll be back in an hour. She makes her way behind the counter, and I grab my purse. I don't get a lot of alone time now that I have Emerson. So I occasionally steal an hour here and there during the workweek when I have someone to back up my absence at the shop. Sometimes I like to sit in my thoughts, and it's impossible to do that in the presence of a child because even when she's asleep I'm in mom mode. And with the constant flow of traffic at work, it's rare that I can find a stretch of peace without being interrupted. I've found that being alone in my car with my music on, and occasionally a slice of dessert from the Cheesecake Factory is sometimes all it takes to sort through the knots in my brain. 
Once I'm parked with a clear view of Boston Harbor, I lean my seat back and grab the notepad and pen I brought with me. I don't know if this will help as much as dessert sometimes does, but I need to release my thoughts in the same way I've done in the past. This method has helped before when I need things to fall neatly into place. Although this time, I'm just hoping it helps things not to fall completely apart. Dear Ellen. Guess who's back? Me. And Atlas. Both of us. I ran into him on my way to meet Ryle with Emmy this morning. It was so good to see him. But as reaffirming as it was to see him and to know where we both stand at this point in our lives, it ended a bit awkwardly. He was having a minor emergency with his restaurant and was in a hurry, I was late opening the store. We parted on the promise that I would text him. I want to text him. I do. Especially because seeing him reminded me of how much I miss the feeling I get. When I'm around him. I didn't realize how lonely I'd been feeling until those few minutes with him this morning. But since Ryle and I divorced, oh, wait. Wow. I haven't told you about the divorce. It's been way too long since I've written to you. Let me back up. I decided my separation from Ryle should be permanent after giving birth to Emmy. I asked him for a divorce right after she was born. I wasn't attempting to be cruel in my timing. I just didn't know which choice I was going to make until I held her in my arms, and knew with every fiber of my being that I would do whatever it took to break the cycle of abuse. Yes, asking for a divorce hurt. Yes, I was heartbroken. But no, I don't regret it. My choice helped me realize that sometimes the hardest decisions a person can make will most likely lead to the best outcomes. I can't lie and say I don't miss him, because I do. I miss what we sometimes were. I miss the family we could have been for Emerson. But I know I made the right decision, even though I sometimes get overwhelmed by the weight of it. It's difficult because I still have to interact with Ryle. He still possesses all the good qualities I fell in love with, and now that I'm no longer in a relationship with him, it's rare I see the negative side that ultimately ended our marriage. I think that has to do with the fact that he's on his best behavior. He had to be agreeable and not put up too much of a fight because he knew I could have reported him, for all the incidents of domestic violence I experienced at his hands. He could have lost a lot more than his wife, so when it came to the custody arrangement, things were more amiable than I expected them to be. That may have been more because I put up less of a fight than he did. My lawyer was very straightforward when I said I wanted sole custody. Unless I was willing. To drag the dirtiest parts of our rock bottom into a courtroom, there wasn't much I could do to prevent Ryle from getting visits with Emerson. And even if I were to bring up the domestic violence, my lawyer said it's very rare that a willing, successful father without a record, who provides financial support, would have any sort of rights removed. I was looking at two options. I could choose to press charges and drag this through the courts, only to be met with a very possible joint custody arrangement. Or I could attempt to work an agreement out with Ryle that would satisfy us both, while preserving our co-parenting relationship. I guess you could say we came to a compromise, even though there isn't an agreement in the world, that would make me feel comfortable with sending my daughter off with someone I know possesses a temper. But all I can do is choose the lesser of two evils when it comes to custody and hope that Emmy never sees that side of him. I want Emmy to bond with her father. I've never wanted to keep her from him. I just want to ensure she's safe, which is why I begged Ryle to agree to day visits for the first couple of years. I never told him outright it's because I don't know that I fully trust him with her. I think I might have blamed it on my breastfeeding situation and the fact that he's on call all the time, but deep down I'm sure he knows why I've never wanted her to stay with him overnight. The past abuse is something we don't talk about. We talk about Emmy, we talk about work, we plaster on smiles when we're in the presence of our daughter. Sometimes it feels forced and fake, at least on my end, but it's better than what this could have been had I taken him to court and lost. I'll fake a smile until she's 18 if it means I don't have to share custody, and potentially expose my daughter to the worst parts of her father on a more regular basis. It's been working out okay, so far, if you don't count the occasional gaslighting and unwanted flirtation from him. As clear as I've made my feelings during this divorce, he still has hope for us. 
He says things sometimes that indicate he hasn't fully let go of the idea of us. I fear that a huge part of Ryle's cooperation rests on the notion that he'll eventually win me back if he's good enough for long enough. He has it in his head that I'll soften over time. But life isn't going to happen his way, Ellen. I'm ultimately going to move on, and if I'm being honest, I hope I end up moving on in Atlas's direction. It's too soon to know if that's a possibility, but I know for a fact I'll never move back in Ryle's direction, no matter how much time passes. It's been almost a year since I asked Ryle for the divorce, but it's been almost 19 months since the fight that ultimately caused our separation. Which means I've been single for over a year and a half. A year and a half of separation between potential relationships seems like plenty of time, and maybe it would be if it were anyone other than Atlas. But how can I possibly make this work? What if I text Atlas and he invites me to lunch? And then lunch goes wonderful, which I'm sure it would, and lunch leads to dinner? And dinner leads to us falling right back into step with where we left off when we were younger? And then we're both happy and we fall back in love and he becomes a permanent part of my life? I know it sounds like I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's Atlas we're talking about here. Unless he had a personality transplant, I think you and I both know how easy Atlas is for me to love, Ellen. That's why I'm so hesitant, because I'm scared it will work out. And if it works out, how will Ryle feel about my new relationship? Emerson is almost a year old, and we've gone this whole year without too much drama, but I know that's because we've found a good flow that nothing has interrupted. So why does it feel like any mention of Atlas will cause a tsunami? Not that Ryle deserves the concern I'm currently feeling over the situation, but he has the potential to make my dating life a living hell. Why does Ryle still occupy an entire wall in my many layers of thoughts? That's what it feels like, as if these wonderful things happen, but as they start to sink in, they eventually reach a part of me that is still making decisions based on Ryle and his potential reactions. His reactions are what I fear the most. I want to hope that he wouldn't be jealous, but he will be. If I start dating Atlas, he'll make it difficult for everyone. Even though I know divorce was the right choice, there are still consequences to that choice. And one of those consequences is that Ryle will always look at Atlas like he's the thing that broke up our marriage. Ryle is the father of my daughter. No matter what man comes and goes in my life from this point forward, Ryle is the one constant that I'll always have to appease if I want the most peaceful experience for my daughter. And if Atlas Corrigan is back in my life, Ryle will never be appeased. I wish you could tell me what decision to make. Do I sacrifice what I know will make me happy for the sake of avoiding the inevitable disruption Atlas's presence would cause? Or will I always have an Atlas-shaped hole in my heart unless I allow him to fill it? He's expecting me to text him, but I think I need more time to process this. I don't even know what to say to him. I don't know what to do. I'll let you know if I figure it out. Lily. Chapter 3 Atlas. We finally reached the shore. Theo says. You actually. Said that to her. Out loud. I shift uncomfortably on the couch. We bonded over. Finding Nemo when we were younger. You quoted a cartoon. Theo's head roll is dramatic. And it didn't work. It's been over eight hours since you ran into her, and she still hasn't texted you. Maybe she got busy. Or maybe you came on too strong, Theo says, leaning forward. He clasps his hands between his knees and refocuses. Okay, so what happened after you said all the cheesy lines? He's brutal. Nothing. We both had to get to work. I asked if she still had my number, and she said she had it memorized, and then we said good. Hold up, Theo interrupts. She has your number. Memorized? Apparently so. Okay. He looks hopeful. This means something. No one memorizes numbers anymore. I was thinking the same thing, but I also wondered if she memorized my number for other reasons. Back when I wrote it down and put it in her phone case, it was for an emergency. Maybe part of her feared the day she'd need it, so she memorized it for reasons that had nothing to do with me. So, what do I do? Text her. Call her. 
wait until she reaches out to me? It's been eight hours, Atlas. Calm down. His advice is giving me whiplash. Two minutes ago, you acted like eight hours without a text was too long. Now you're telling me to calm down? Theo shrugs and then kicks my desk to make his chair spin. I'm 12. I don't even have a phone yet, and you want my opinion on texting etiquette? It surprises me that he doesn't have a phone yet. Brad doesn't seem like he would be a strict father. Why don't you have a phone? Dad says I can have one when I turn 13. Two more months, he says wistfully. Theo has been coming to the restaurant a couple of days a week after school since Brad's promotion six months ago. Theo told me he wanted to be a therapist when he grows up, so I let him practice on me. At first, the talks we would have were intended for his benefit. But lately, I feel like I'm the one benefiting. Brad peeks his head into my office in search of his son. Let's go. Atlas has work to do. He motions for Theo to stand up, but Theo just keeps spinning in my desk chair. Atlas is the one who called me in here. He needed advice. I'll never understand whatever this is, Brad says, pointing between me and Theo. What advice do you get from my son? How to avoid your chores and win at Minecraft. Theo stands up and stretches his arms over his head. Girls, actually. And winning isn't the point of Minecraft, Dad. It's more of a sandbox game. Theo looks over his shoulder at me as he's leaving my office. Just text her. He says that like it's the obvious solution. Maybe it is. Brad yanks him away from the door. I settle back into my desk chair and stare at my blank phone screen. Maybe she memorized the wrong number. I open her contact and hesitate. Theo could be right. I could have come on too strong this morning. We didn't say much. When we ran into each other, but what we did say had meaning and intent. Maybe that scared her. Or, maybe I'm right and she memorized the wrong number. My fingers hover over my phone's keyboard. I want to text her, but I don't want to pressure her. However, she and I both know our lives would have turned out so different if I hadn't made so many missteps with her in the past. I spent years making excuses for why my life wasn't good enough for her to be a part of it, but Lily always fit. She was a perfect fit. I refuse to let her walk away this time without a little more effort on my part. I'll start with making sure she has my correct number. It was good seeing you today, Lily. I wait to see if she's going to text me back. When I see the three dots pop up, I hold my breath in anticipation. You too. I stare at her response for way too long, hoping it'll be accompanied by another text. But it isn't. That's all I'm getting. It's only two words, but I can read between the lines. I sigh in defeat and drop my phone onto my desk. Chapter 4 Lily Mine and Ryle's situation has been an unconventional one since Emerson was born. I don't think many couples file divorce papers at the same time they sign their newborn's birth certificate. As much as I was disappointed in Ryle for being the thing that forced me to have to make the decision to end our marriage, I didn't want to prevent him from bonding with our daughter. I cooperate with him as much as I can since his schedule is so hectic. I sometimes even take her to his work to visit him on his lunch break. He's also had a key to my place since before Emerson was born. I only gave it to him because I lived alone and was afraid I'd go into labor and he'd need access to the apartment. But he never gave the key back after her birth, even though I've been meaning to ask him for it. He sometimes uses it on the rare occasions he has a late surgery and has extra time to spend with Emmy in the mornings, after I head to work. That's why I haven't asked for it back. But lately, he's been using the key to bring Emmy home. He texted me just before I closed the shop earlier and told me Emmy was tired, so he was taking her to my place to put her to bed. The frequency he's been using the key lately is making me wonder if Emmy is the only one he's trying to spend more time with. My front door is unlocked when I finally make it to my apartment. Ryle is in the kitchen. He glances up at me when he hears the front door shut. I grabbed dinner, he says, holding up a bag from my favorite Thai place. You haven't eaten, have you? 
I don't like this. He's been making himself more and more comfortable here. But I'm emotionally drained from the day already, so I shake my head and decide to confront the issue at a different time. I haven't. Thank you. I set my purse on the table and pass the kitchen, heading for Emmy's room. I just laid her down, he warns. I pause right outside her door and press my ear to it. It's quiet, so I back away from the door and head into the kitchen without waking her. I feel awful about my short response to Atlas earlier, but this interaction with Ryle is confirming all my concerns. How am I supposed to start something with someone new when my ex still brings me dinner and has a key to my apartment? I need to set firm boundaries with Ryle before I can even begin to entertain the idea of Atlas. Ryle chooses a bottle of red wine from my tabletop wine rack. Mind if I open this? I shrug as I spoon pad tie onto my plate. Go ahead, but I don't want any. Ryle puts the bottle back and opts for a glass of tea. I grab a water out of the fridge, and we both take a seat at the table. How was she today? I ask him. A little cranky, but I had a lot of errands to run. I think she just got tired of going in and out of the car seat. She was better when we went over to Alyssa's. When's your next day off? I ask him. Not sure. I'll let you know. He reaches forward and uses his thumb to wipe something off my cheek. I flinch a little, but he doesn't notice. Or maybe he pretends not to. I'm not sure if he realizes the reaction I have any time his hand comes near me is a negative one. Knowing Ryle, he probably thinks I flinched because I felt a spark. After Emmy was born, there were moments here and there when I would feel a spark between us. He'd do or say something sweet, or he'd be holding Emmy while he sang to her, and I would feel that familiar desire for him bubbling up inside of me. But I somehow found it within me to pull myself out of the moment every time. It only takes one bad memory to immediately dull any fleeting feelings I have in his presence. It's been a long, bumpy road, but those feelings are finally non-existent. I attribute that to the list I wrote of all the reasons why I chose to divorce him. Sometimes, after he leaves, I go to my bedroom and read it to reiterate that this arrangement is the best one for all of us. Well. Maybe not this exact arrangement. I'd still like my key returned to me. I'm about to take another bite of noodles when I hear a muffled ping come from my purse across the table. I drop my fork and quickly reach for my phone before Ryle does. Not that he would read my texts, but the last thing I want right now is for him to even try to be polite by handing me my phone. He might see that the text is from Atlas, and I'm not prepared for the storm that would bring. The text isn't from Atlas, though. It's from my mother. She's sending pics of Emmy she took earlier this week. I set the phone down and pick up my fork, but Ryle is staring at me. It was my mother, I say. I don't know why I even say that. I don't owe him an explanation, but I don't like the way he's staring at me. Who are you hoping it would be? You practically lunged across the table for your phone. No one. I take a drink. He's still staring. I have no idea how well Ryle can read me, but it looks like he knows I'm lying. He spins his fork in his noodles and looks down at his plate with a hardened jaw. Are you seeing someone? There's an edge to his voice now. Not that it's any of your business, but no. Not saying it is my business. Just having a casual conversation. I don't respond to that because it's a lie. Any recently divorced husband asking his ex-wife if she's seeing someone is making anything but casual conversation. I do think we need to have a more serious conversation at some point about dating, he says. Before either of us brings other people around Emerson. Maybe lay some ground rules. I nod. I think we need to lay ground rules for a lot more than just that. His eyes narrow. Like what? Your access to my apartment. I swallow. I'd like my key back. Ryle stares stoically before he responds. Then he wipes his mouth and says, I can't put my daughter to bed? That's not what I'm saying at all. You know my schedule is crazy, Lily. I hardly get to see her as it is. 
I'm not saying I want you to see her any less. I just want my key back. I value my privacy. Ryle's expression is tight. He's upset with me. I knew he would be, but he's making this into more than it is. It has nothing to do with how much I want him to see Emmy. I just don't want him having easy access to my apartment. I moved out and divorced him for a reason. It's not going to be a huge change, but it's one that needs to happen, or we'll be stuck in this unhealthy routine forever. I'll just start keeping her overnight, then. He says it with such conviction while eyeing me for a reaction. I know he can feel the discomfort I'm suddenly drowning in. I keep my voice calm. I don't think I'm ready for that. Ryle drops his fork on his plate with a thud. Maybe we need to modify the custody arrangement. Those words infuriate me, but I somehow prevent my rage from boiling over. I stand and pick up my plate. Really, Ryle? I ask for the key to my apartment back and you threaten me with court? We agreed to this arrangement, but he's acting like that was for my benefit rather than his. He knows I could have taken him to court for sole custody after everything he put me through. Hell, I never even had him arrested. He should be grateful I've been as generous as I have. When I get to the kitchen, I set down my plate and grip the edges of the counter, allowing my head to drop between my shoulders. Calm down, Lily. He's just reacting. I hear Ryle sigh regretfully, and then he follows me into the kitchen. He leans against the counter while I rinse my plate. Can you at least give me a timeline? His voice is lower when he speaks. When will I get overnights with her? I press my hip against the counter and face him. When she can talk. Why then? I hate that he even needs me to say this out loud. So she can tell me if something happens, Ryle. When the full meaning of what I've just said sinks in, he chews on his bottom lip with a small nod. I can see the frustration in the veins that rise in his neck. He pulls his keys out of his pocket and removes my apartment key. He tosses it on the counter and walks away. When he grabs his jacket and disappears out the front door, I feel that familiar twinge of guilt creeping into my chest. The guilt is always followed by doubts like, am I being too hard on him? And what if he really has changed? I know the answers to these questions, but sometimes it feels good to read the reminders. I go to my room and pull the list out of my jewelry box. 1. He slapped you because you laughed. 2. He pushed you down a flight of stairs. 3. He bit you. 4. He tried to force himself on you. 5. You had to get stitches because of him. 6. Your husband physically hurt you more than once. It would have happened again and again. 7. You did this for your daughter. I run my finger over the tattoo on my shoulder, feeling the small scars he left there with his teeth. If Ryle did these things to me at the highest points of our relationship, what would he be capable of at the lowest? I fold the list and put it back in my jewelry box for the next time I might need a reminder. Chapter 5 Atlas It was definitely targeted, Brad says, staring at the graffiti. Whoever vandalized Bibbs two nights ago decided to hit up my newest restaurant last night. Corrigan's has two damaged windows, and there's another message spray painted across the back door. Fuck you Atlas. They added an S and underlined ass in my name. I catch myself wanting to laugh at the cleverness, but my mood isn't making space for humor this morning. Yesterday, the vandalism barely phased me. I don't know if it was because I had just run into Lily and was still riding that high, but this morning I woke up stuck on her apparent avoidance of me. Because of that, the damage to my newest restaurant feels like it's cutting a little deeper. I'll check the security footage. I'm hoping it reveals something useful. I still don't know if I want to go to the police. Maybe if it's someone I know, I can at least confront them before I'm forced to resort to that. Brad follows me into my office. I power on the computer and open the security app. I think Brad can feel my frustration, because he doesn't speak while I search the footage for several minutes. There, Brad says, pointing to the lower left-hand corner of the screen. I slow down the footage until we see a figure. When I hit play, we both stare in confusion. 
Someone is curled up on the back steps, unmoving. We watch the screen for about half a minute, until I hit rewind again. According to the timestamp on the footage, the person remains on the steps for over two hours. Without a blanket, in a Boston October. They slept here. Brad says. They weren't too worried about getting caught, were they? I rewind the footage even more until it shows the person walking into the frame for the first time, a little after one in the morning. Because it's dark, it's hard to make out facial features, but they seem young. More like a teenager than an adult. They snoop around for a few minutes, dig through the dumpster. Check the lock on the back door. Pull out the spray paint and leave their clever message. Then they use the can of spray paint to attempt to break the windows, but Corrigan's windows are triple-paned, so the person eventually gets bored, or grows tired of trying to make a big enough hole to fit through like they did at Bibbs. That's when they proceed to lie down on the back steps, where they fall asleep. Just before the sun rises, they wake up, look around, and then casually walk away like the entire night never happened. Do you recognize him? Brad asks. No. You? Nope. I pause the footage on what may be the clearest visual we can get of the person, but it's grainy. They're wearing jeans and a black hoodie with the hood pulled tight so that their hair isn't visible. There's no way we would be able to recognize whoever this is if we saw them in person. It isn't a clear enough picture, and they never looked straight at the camera. The police wouldn't even find this footage useful. I send the file to my email anyway. Right when I hit send, a phone pings. I glance at mine, but it's Brad who received a text. Darren says Bibbs is fine. He pockets his phone and heads toward my office door. I'll start cleaning up. I wait for the file to finish sending to my email, then I start the footage over again, feeling more pity than irritation. It just reminds me of the cold nights I spent in that abandoned house before Lily offered me the shelter of her bedroom. I can practically feel the chill in my bones just thinking about it. I have no idea who this could be. It's unnerving that they wrote my name on the door, and even more unnerving that they felt comfortable enough to hang out and take a two-hour nap. It's like they're daring me to confront them. My phone begins to vibrate on my desk. I reach for it, but it's a number I don't recognize. I normally don't answer those, but Lily is still in the back of my mind. She could be calling me from a work phone. God, I sound pathetic. I raise the phone to my ear. Hello? There's a sigh on the other end. A female. She sounds relieved that I answered. Atlas? I sigh, too, but not from relief. I sigh because it isn't Lily's voice. I'm not sure whose it is, but anyone other than Lily is disappointing, apparently. I lean back in my office chair. Can I help you? It's me. I have no idea who Amy is. I think back to any exes that could be calling me, but none of them sound like this person. And none of them would assume I would know who they were if they simply said, it's me. Who's speaking? Me, she says again, emphasizing it like it'll make a difference. Sutton. Your mother. I immediately pull the phone away from my ear and look at the number again. This has to be some kind of prank. How would my mother get my phone number? Why would she? Want it? It's been years since she made it clear she never wanted to see me again. I say nothing. I have nothing to say. I stretch my spine and lean forward, waiting for her to spit out the reason she finally put forth the effort to contact me. I. Um. Dot. She pauses. I can hear a television on in the background. It sounds like the price is right. I can almost picture her sitting on the couch, a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other at 10 in the morning. She mostly worked nights when I was growing up, so she'd eat dinner and then stay up to watch The Price is Right before going to sleep. It was my least favorite time of day. What do you want? My voice is clipped. She makes a noise in the back of her throat, and even though it's been years, I can tell she's annoyed. I can tell in that one release of breath that she didn't want to call me. 
she's doing it because she has to. She's not reaching out to apologize, she's reaching out because she's desperate. Are you dying? I ask. It's the only thing that would prevent me from ending this call. Am I dying? She repeats my question with laughter as if I'm absurd and unreasonable and an ass, whole. No, I'm not dying. I'm perfectly fine. Do you need money? Who doesn't? Every ounce of anxiety she used to fill me with returns in just these few seconds on the phone with her. I immediately end the call. I have nothing to say to her. I block her number, regretful that I gave her as long as I did to speak. I should have ended the call as soon as she told me who she was. I lean forward over my desk and cradle my head in my hands. My stomach is churning from the unexpectedness of the last couple of minutes. I'm surprised by my reaction, honestly. I thought this might happen one day, but I imagined myself not caring. I assumed. I'd feel as indifferent toward her returning to my life as I did when she forced me to leave hers. But back then, I was indifferent to a lot of things. Now I actually like my life. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I have absolutely no desire to allow anyone from my past to come in and threaten that. I run my hands over my face, forcing down the last few minutes, then I push back from my desk. I walk outside to help Brad with the repairs and do my best to move beyond this moment. It's hard, though. It's like my past is crashing into me from all directions, and I have absolutely no one to discuss this with. After a few minutes of both of us working in silence, I say to Brad, you need to get Theo a phone, he's almost 13. Brad laughs. You need to get a therapist who's closer to your age.